Hello all and welcome to this tutorial on AWS Database Migration Services or DMS. Today we will discuss how to migrate data from MySQL server to a S3 bucket. Before we go further ahead with the tutorial, a couple of things to keep in mind. First is that not all AWS DMS replication instances are free. So in case you happen to do this tutorial by yourself later, uh, you can potentially incur charges for DMS service and DMS replication instances. Second thing to keep in mind that if you are doing this tutorial later on your own, ensure that you clean up your resources after the tutorial is over in order to avoid any future surprise charges. Now for this particular tutorial, it requires a certain amount of pre-prep and all the steps that I have enlisted on this slide, I have actually gone ahead and completed those steps uh, in order to move further ahead with the actual database migration steps. So you'll require a certain amount of pre-prep that is setting up both the data, uh, the target and the source uh, uh, data sources, and also creating you know a table, a, a database, and a table in MySQL and inserting a few records. So let us review through all the pre-prep steps. The first thing that you will need to do is you need to create an empty S3 bucket named my DMS bucket for CSV. Now that is the bucket name that I have used in this tutorial. We are free to use any other bucket name as well. Just ensure that the bucket is empty. Even if you have something in the bucket, it should not typically matter. The second thing is launch a MySQL RDS instance in your default VPC or in your custom VPC. Now for this particular tutorial, I have launched my MySQL RDS instance in my default VPC. You can potentially even go ahead and launch it in your custom VPC. When you're launching your My SQL RDS instance, ensure that you use a free tier and you use the instance type as dbt to micro with MySQL version 5.7x. One thing to keep in mind is that the version of MySQL is very important because DMS does not work with any version that is higher than 5.7. It is typically compatible with version 5.5, 5.6, and 5.7. The next thing after we have launched our MySQL RDS server instance is we will launch a Amazon Linux EC2 instance in the same VPC and preferably the same AZ as well. And in the security group for our Linux EC2 instance, ensure that you have inbound ports 22 and 3306 open. 3306 is the port used by uh, MySQL. And since this is going to be a client and it will communicate with our MySQL server, we need to ensure that port 3306 is open. And 22 is for us to SSH and you know create uh, databases tables or even check insert records and check uh, how many records are there okay that's just for basic client server uh, interaction okay the next thing that we need to do is we need to modify our rds uh, security group so the rds server that we launched over here creates either its own security group or if you're using an existing security group you need to ensure that you provide access to EC2's security group and VPC's default security group. Now, the reason why you need the EC2, uh, that is the instance that you created on in step three, that EC2 security group, because that EC2 is going to connect to our MySQL server. It is the client. And the default VPC security group is because the replication instance that uh, we will launch it is typically associated with VPC's default security group. If you are creating a separate security group for your replication instance, then you need to ensure that that security group is able to communicate with RDS on port 3306, just like this port right here. 
Okay, the next thing that you need to do after you have done your basic setup is SSH into your EC2 instance and switch or change to the root user and that the command for that is sudo su and go ahead and install the mysql client and this is the command sudo yum install mysql and after you have installed mysql you need to go ahead and create a database called as library and a table named books and insert a few records in the books table now what i have done is i've actually created mysql.txt it is right here on github the url is right here i will even have it posted in the description of this video so if you want you can go ahead and download this file from github as well and use it for your own tutorial so let us switch to mysql uh, txt and look at this particular file so this is mysql txt and as you see the first uh, uh, the first line over here is create database library and you can use this command to create the database the next thing that we are going to do is create the table uh, books so, and this is the schema of our books table as you see it has uh, four columns and the primary key is the book id and after we have created the books table uh, what you need to do is you need to insert these five records in the books table so as you see we have five different books over here mysql oracle sql server db2 and aurora it is a pretty simple table and keep it simple guys so that uh, you can do the you can focus more on the replication rather than focusing on the database and the table and the table's contents okay okay so i will have this particular mysql txt posted uh, on this particular github url so you can uh, probably download it from there and use it for your own tutorial when you're practicing okay so these are the core steps so let's move on to the next the actual set of steps where we begin with the data migration okay so uh, before we go there i'm going to switch to my aws account and let us review through a couple of things. So the first thing that I want to review is the S3 bucket. So my S3 bucket is right here, as you see, it's with the same name and it is empty. So our, bu our bucket is there. So our target uh, is present. The next thing you want to ensure that our source is present. So this is my RDS, uh, my SQL instance, as you see, it's right here my dms uh, 2018 and i believe the instance is available and we should be able to see the instance details shortly especially the instance endpoint is very important so it is right here scroll down so this is the engine as you see is 5.7 db2 micro instance is available and this is our endpoint and on port 3306 and again my default security group and my ec2 security group are able to communicate to this particular um, rds instance on port 3306 so let's quickly just check that as well to ensure our setup is is right and complete so the security group should come up shortly and there it is and this is inbound and there you go this is my ec2 security group and this is my default security vpc security group and they're communicating on port 3306 so perfect and after that i think so i've copy pasted uh, my um my my sql server endpoint uh, right here this is the endpoint and this is the endpoint that we will use to also connect uh, from our client okay and this is my db name uh, username and password as you see they're all the same i mean this is just to ensure that i don't forget it guys okay I mean, you don't want to spend time debugging that your, your password was wrong 
Okay, so this is coming back to our RDS instance and these are rest of the other default uh, uh, properties. So as you see, they're all right here. Okay, so our uh, server is also up, so our source is up as well. And finally, this is my EC2 instance right here. And where is my EC2? Oh, this is not EC2 instance. Okay, sorry, that was not, that was a security group. Let me quickly switch to my EC2 instance. So this, is, this should come up shortly. I have one EC2 instance, which is my client actually, and where the MySQL client has already been installed and it is up and running right here. And this is the public IP. So you can copy this and you can putty into this right there. Okay. So what I have done is I've actually connected to my EC2 instance right here, as you see. So let me just go ahead and clear everything. So I'll switch to uh, the root account now. And then we will connect to my SQL server. So the, so the command to connect to my SQL server is this. So my SQL minus H, the entire uh, DNS of your MySQL server. Uh, hyphen capital P is the port, the username, and then it'll prompt you for the password. So I'm gonna control C, copy this command, paste it right here, and click enter. And again, my password is my uh, DMS 2018, and there it is, so I'm connected. So let us uh, quickly see what databases are there on the server. So show databases. As you see, a library database is right there. So use uh, library and the database has been changed and we can go ahead and see the number what tables are there in this database. As you see, a books table is present. And then we will say select star from books. And as you see, we have our five records. We can see the schema of the table as well, book ID title, publish date description, and all our five records are available. So in short, we are all set, okay? Uh, our server, uh, a source server, target S3 bucket, and a client uh, to SQL is also connected, and we also have a database and a table up and running. Okay, so let me go back to the presentation. And okay, so this is the presentation right here. Mm. Okay, there it is. So now let us begin with the actual steps for database migration service. So the first thing that we need to do is we need to create an IAM role that provides a read write access to S3. Remember we are gonna create a bunch of folders and create a file in S3 and also read write access to RDS. So that is our first step guys. So let us go ahead and uh, do that. So I'm gonna switch back to my AWS console, okay, and let me switch to IAM. So this is IAM right there. And here we will create a new role. And again, um, since this is for demo purposes, and I just want to ensure that uh, we have the right uh, uh, right amount of access for the uh, for our role. I'm just gonna go ahead and give full access to S3, okay, and RDS as well. So I'm gonna go ahead and create a new role right here. And it is going to be for DMS and it will select DMS right there. Click next run permissions. And I'm just gonna keep this simple guys. Again, the focus is not on security over here. The focus is on database migration. So I'm gonna go and select S3. And basically I'm just gonna use one of the available policies instead of creating an inline policy with, the, with a set of uh, permissions. And I'm gonna 
review. And I'm going to give this the name as uh, my SQL to S3. Okay. And create the role. So our role should be created in a few minutes. This sometimes takes a while. So there it is. Okay. So our role has been created. So let us review it. And we need to also provide access to RDS. So as you see, it has access to S3 because it's going to write over there. And I'm also going to go ahead and attach uh, policies. Again, I'm going to use one of the available managed policies for RDS because it needs to uh, attach RDS. Uh, it needs to basically connect to RDS and also uh, have permissions to uh, read the database and the table and also extract uh, or basically select information from our table. So I'm going to just go ahead and provide full access at this time. And the policy has been attached. And as you see, our role has two policies. Um, oh, I selected the wrong one. It looks like that. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and I selected Alexa by mistake. Sorry, guys. Um, okay, there it is. So now I have the Amazon RDS full access. Perfect. And this is the ARN for my role. So I'm going to copy this and I'm just going to stick it on my notepad right here somewhere. Okay. We will be using the ARN for this role when we set up the, the actual migration task. Okay. And the endpoints. Okay. So our role has been created. So that was the first step. The next thing is now to go to the AWS database migration service and create the replication instance. Now, ensure that you create the instance for the smallest size, like dbt to micro. Again, even if you select the smallest size, you can still incur charges for the replication instance, okay? Only a few instances are free, but uh, yeah, you can still potentially go ahead, go ahead and still incur charges for your replication instance. I'm gonna switch now, and I'm gonna to go to database migration services right here. And the first thing that we will do is we'll create a replication instance. So click on replication instances. So here is replication instances. And then as you see, only list instances labeled free comply with our free DMS program guidelines. We can visit this page. Um, I've, I've tried this several amount of times. I've typically not seen a free instance, but anyways. You can feel free to you know, explore this and if you are able to get a free instance, that's perfect. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and create the replication instance now. Okay, and uh, I'm gonna give this a name, DMS uh, replication instance. And I'm gonna give the same as the description as well. And ensure that the T2 uh, micro is selected so it's going to be DMST to micro and it's going to be in my default VPC. It's not going to be multi AZ and you can leave it publicly accessible. That's fine. Um, in advanced, ensure that your uh, allocated storage is around eight GB is fine. It's going to be in my default VPC. I'm going to put this in US East 1A and the security group that I'm going to associate is going to be the default security group. Remember, we had modified our RDS to ensure that both EC2 and default security groups can communicate over 3306 port. Okay, and let's go ahead and create this replication instance. So it generally takes a while to create the replication instance, okay? So I'm going to refresh and see as you see it's creating right now. Okay, so the next thing that we need to do is after we have created our replication instance is to create a source endpoint for my SQL table and then test the endpoint. And after that, we need to create a target endpoint for our S3 bucket and test the S3 endpoint as well. So I'm going to switch back and we are going to create a couple of endpoints. Now, we can go ahead and create the endpoint, guys, but you will not be able to test the endpoint 
until the replication instance is going to be available. Okay, so it is still taking some time. So I'm gonna go ahead and click on endpoints right now. And let's try and create an endpoint. It's right there, it's coming up. So it's gonna be a source endpoint. And as you see, it gives you an option over here to select RDS DB instance. So check this option. And as you see, it automatically selected our RDS uh, MySQL server. It's given an endpoint identifier as a source. And again, the source engine is MySQL. And it has also got our um, server's DNS right there. The port is 3306, which is the right port. We are not going to encrypt, so it's going to be SSL. Again, my username is my DMS 2018 and copy this over here. The same username will copy this because the same thing is my password. And okay, let us check the any advanced options that we need. We okay, I think we are good with the advanced options right here. And for VPC, this is going to be in my default VPC. And the replication instance is the one that we just created. I believe our instance is up and running now. So it is giving us the option to run the test. So let's run this test and check if it's successful. Okay, so the replication instance is still not active. So once the replication instance is active, only then it will allow me to go ahead and test this endpoint. So I'm gonna give this a few minutes and I'll pause my recording. And once the instance is up and it allows me to test the endpoint, I will resume recording again. So server is up and running now and it's available. As you see, it's right here. It's available now. So we should be able to now test this. So let us try and test this uh, endpoint. So click on run test. And generally testing the endpoint also takes a while and hopefully all our params are correct and the test is successful. If the test fails, then we'll have to figure out um, if any parameters are, are incorrect. So generally, let's say if you are trying this by yourself and the endpoint connection test fails, just check your uh, the DNS of your server or the port or the username or the password. These are the generally the four parameters which you know you tend to goof up. Okay, so our connection was tested successfully and a source has been created. So we are going to go ahead and click on save right here. So as you see, our source endpoint is now active. The next uh, step for us was to basically create the target endpoint as you see over here for our S3 bucket and test that endpoint. So let's go ahead and do that. So click on create endpoint, and this is gonna be a target, and we're gonna give it the name as uh, S3 target, and the, tar the engine over here is gonna be S3, and we need the service access role ARN. So I'm gonna go ahead and copy the ARN of our role right here, okay and paste it. And the bucket name that we had was my DMS bucket for CSV. Uh, I'm not gonna give any folder over there. And in the advanced options, just leave it blank at this time. VPC is gonna be default VPC. And the instance is the instance that we just created, the replication instance. And click on run test. So it takes a couple of minutes to complete this uh, endpoint testing. And hopefully this is successful. Again, if this uh, part is not successful or if you get any errors, definitely check your uh, bucket name, check uh, the, the role access. It should have for retried access to S3. And that was one of the main reasons, I mean, when I was Trying this earlier, I was getting a lot of errors. So I just kind of decided to go ahead and give full access to the particular role. 
okay so connection was tested successfully so our target endpoint is also active and connected so after we have created our endpoints the next step for us is to basically go ahead and create the actual task to migrate the data and this task will actually migrate the data from our mysql which is a source and uh, to our s3 bucket which is our target endpoint and after we have created the task we need to run the task and finally after our task is is run and uh, it is it runs successfully hopefully in that case uh, it should create a dot csv file in our s3 bucket under the folder library uh, and a subfolder called as books okay so um, let's click on tasks right here and create a new task and we are going to give this a name as mysql 2 s3 okay this is our application instance right there this is a source endpoint as you see it selected our mysql source endpoint our s3 target endpoint and migration type is migrating existing data and we check this uh, start task on create because we want this task to immediately uh, start in target uh, drop tables on target is fine anyways this is an s3 and you can't do much on s3 except like creating a table or dropping a table or truncating so uh, it's not actually a table it's a folder essentially and a file so drop tables on target option is just fine um, we don't have any lobs i'm not going to include any lobs right there and then for our table mappings right here we're going to use the guided version uh, so you want to select where so the name of the schema as you see is library is coming up on its own because the endpoint is connected and the name of the table is books and the action is include and uh, say add selection rule so basically it is going to uh, uh, look for the schema library and look for the table books and migrate all the data from this particular books table into a csv and post that csv in our s3 bucket so go ahead and click on create task and after our task is created remember we had checked the start task on on create option so it should immediately start um, after it has been created now here you can see the overview and here you can see the actual table statistics as to how many records were read uh, and and loaded to our uh, in our s3 bucket in the csv essentially so keep on refreshing this as you see right here still in it is still creating right now so once it is uh, in a running state then we will be able to see so as you see it's starting now so try and see okay there is nothing over here in table statistics again click here and the moment it is in the running state we should be able to see something in our table statistics you know how many records so remember we have five records and all those five records uh, should be uh, extracted and copied to a csv file so it is still starting okay okay there it is okay i think it's already ran it's not yet it's not refreshing correctly but as you see uh, library schema books uh, table completed so it's already completed the road it has loaded five records in total okay and there it is it was running and then it went directly to load complete awesome so if we go back now to our uh, s3 bucket so this is our s3 bucket right here and we should be able to see the library folder and the subfolder called as books and in that subfolder we should see our csv file so click on um, our bucket right here as you see this is our library folder under our library folder is books under books is our csv file right there so there it is if you want you can go ahead and download this file 
and try and open it. Okay, so let me try and open this. It is probably downloaded in my downloads folder. So there it is, downloads. There, my CSV is right there. And you can open this in Excel. And it should actually have all the records in this. So as you see, uh, this is right here. So as you see, all our records, all the file records have been extracted out successfully to our uh, CSV file. Okay, yeah, so that's pretty much it from me, guys. I mean, this is this was a quick tutorial on AWS database migration services, and you can pretty much migrate from any database to any database. Um, I mean, this one is MySQL to S3. You can even go the reverse route that is from S3 to MySQL, and I'll have a separate video created for that or probably from MySQL to SQL Server or Postgres or MySQL to Aurora uh, or potentially any other database. So hopefully this uh, tutorial was helpful and it cleared your uh, uh, doubts and laid a good foundation around database migration services. The steps are the same. A few properties will change here and there depending upon the type of database, but uh, the tasks uh, uh, and the whole process of migrating data from one uh, database to the other database is, is the same. Okay, guys, so thank you very much. And please post your comment. If you like my video, do like it. And uh, please subscribe to my channel. So you will be the first one to know uh, the moment I post any new videos. So thank you. And have a nice day. Bye-bye. Hello all and welcome to this AWS tutorial on AWS Database Migration Service or DMS. Today we will discuss how to migrate data from a S3 bucket to a MySQL RDS database. Before we go further ahead with the tutorial, a couple of things to keep in mind. Not all AWS DMS replication instances are free and using DMS service can incur charges. The second thing that you want to keep in mind is to ensure that you clean up resources after this tutorial is complete. This is to avoid any unwanted or surprise charges in the future. For this particular tutorial, I have actually done certain amount of pre prep and before going further ahead with the actual DMS steps, please ensure that you complete these steps uh, ahead of time, okay? So let us review to the steps that are required. The first thing that we need to do is we need to launch a MySQL RDS instance in our default VPC. Now you could launch this instance in your custom VPC as well. Ensure that you use free tier and you use the instance type as dbt to micro with MySQL version 5.7.x. Okay, now the MySQL versions that are compatible with AWS DMS are 5.5, 5.6, and 5.7. So you could use pretty much any of those. Anything that is above 5.7 is not compatible with AWS DMS. After we have launched our MySQL RDS instance, the next thing that we will do is we need to launch a Amazon Linux EC2 instance with public IP in the same VPC. So if you have launched your MySQL RDS instance in your default VPC, then ensure that the EC2 instance is also in the same VPC. We will be using this EC2 instance as our MySQL client to connect to our MySQL RDS server. Ensure that ports 22 and 3306 are open in EC2 security group for inbound communication. The next thing that we need to do is we need to modify our MySQL RDS security group 
to provide inbound access to our EC2 security group and uh, VPC's default security group on port 3306. After that, we need to SSH into our EC2 instance and switch or change to the root user. The command to do that is sudo su. And then the next thing after that we need to do is we need to go ahead and install MySQL client. The command to install MySQL client is sudo yum install MySQL. So after we have completed all of the above steps, the last step as a part of pre prep is to ensure that we create an empty bucket called as MyDMS 2018. So I have already gone ahead and completed all of these uh, steps. So ensure that you complete all these steps before moving further ahead. And then you can uh, follow through the tutorial step by step. So let us review through uh, all these steps that I have completed so far. So let me switch to my AWS uh, console right here. So this is my AWS console over here, guys. And as you see, this is my uh, security group. Hold on, let me switch to my RDS instance over here. Okay, so let me click on DB instances. So this is my MySQL RDS instance right here, as you see, my DMS 2018. If I click on that, you will see that the engine type is 5.7.23 and the DB instance class is dbt2 micro our uh, rds instance is not currently available and this is the endpoint so make a note of this endpoint because we will be using this endpoint to connect to our uh, rds instance from our databases right here okay okay and it is going to communicate on port 3306 and this is our security group for our uh, MySQL RDS instance. So if I click on the security group, we can look at its details. Remember as part of our pre prep steps, we have to ensure that our EC2 security group and our VPC's default security group are able to communicate with the server on port 3306. So as you see, this is my EC2 security group and this is my VPC's default security group and they are able to communicate on port 3306 with this particular MySQL RDS server. So I'm going to go ahead and cancel this now. Okay, so this is our RDS right there and at the bottom again it's uh, all the rest of the properties as you see we have our ARN and uh, as you see, it's, it's using the storage as 20 gigabits. Uh, Multi-AZ is not enabled because this is just for tutorial or demo purposes. And yep, rest of all the other properties are set, set as default. So I'm gonna leave this as is. And the next thing that we will review is our EC2 instance, which is right here. Now this particular EC2 instance is our MySQL client. So as you see it's running, it has a public IP associated to it. And this is my EC2 security group. So let's go ahead and click on that. You need to ensure that this particular security group has port 22 and port 3306 open for inbound communication. Now I have actually gone ahead and SSH into our EC2 instance right here. And I, I have also installed my SQL client uh, on this machine. So as you see, the installation has been completed. Okay, so our RDS server and our MySQL client, both of them are up and running. The next thing that we need to do is we need to check on our S3 bucket. So let's click on S3 over here. And this is my bucket right here. It is my DMS 2018. And as you see, this is an empty bucket at this point of time. So all our pre uh, prep steps are complete and we are all set to move further ahead with the actual DMS step to perform migration from S3 to MySQL. 
So let me switch back to my presentation and go to the next slide. So these are all the steps to migrate data from S3 to MySQL. The first thing that we need to do is that we need to create a role that provides read access to S3 and write access to RDS. And after we create this role, we need to note its ARL. So let me switch back to my uh, AWS console, which is right here. And I'm gonna switch to IAM and we will create this particular role. So click on roles, create new role, and choose the service that will use this role. So in this case, it is going to be DMS. And click on DMS, click on next permission. Now remember, we have to provide read-only access for S3. So let's search for S3 and say Amazon S3 read-only access. Next review, and we will give this name as S3 to my SQL. And let us click on create role. Now, along with uh, a read uh, access for S3, we also need to provide write access for RDS because that's where it is going to actually go ahead and create a database, then create a table, and then eventually insert all the records in a table. Now, just to keep things simple, I'm actually going to go ahead and provide full access uh, to RDS over here. But if you're doing this in production, guys, ensure that uh, you create an inline policy and then provide uh, access as per whatever actions or that you need to perform okay i'm just keeping this simple over here because the focus of this video is not security the focus of this video is dms okay so let us go ahead and attach policies and we will look for rds and i'm going to go ahead and attach Amazon RDS full access and click on attach policy. And as you see, our policy has been attached. So now our role has full access to RDS and read only access to S3. So let us go ahead and note its ARN. So go ahead and copy this. And I'm gonna keep it aside over here in my notepad. Okay, so let me switch back to my presentation. So we've created this role and we've noted its ARN. The next thing is to go through S3 to our S3 bucket and create a folder called as address and then a subfolder named zip code. So let us go over here and let us switch to S3. Now this is our bucket and as you see our bucket is currently empty. So we will create a folder over here called as address and save and under address we will create another subfolder called as zip code and then click on save again and this is our zip code folder so as you see the hierarchy over here is that it's our bucket under our bucket is a folder called as address and under address there's another folder called as zip code now I want to highlight a couple of things to you that when you're using S3 as a, a source for AWS DMS, there is a specific structure that you need to follow well before you go further ahead. Okay, so there's a reason why we created these folders in the specific uh, sequence. So let me switch to this particular article. And this is the article as you see using Amazon Simple Storage Service as a source for AWS DMS. Now, in short, what it, this particular tutorial tells us is that, that whatever, wherever our CSV files are, like as you see the CSV file is right here, the folder right above that is a table name and the folder right on the top, uh, that is two levels above our CSV is a schema name. So let us take an example over here. So as you see, this is an example that they have taken. This is uh, in, under S3, it is, there's a bucket called as my bucket. And under my bucket, there is a folder called as HR. And under HR, there's another folder called as employee. So in this case, my bucket is the bucket name. 
HR is the schema name or the database name and employee is the table name and under employee we will actually have whatever uh, you know uh, xyz or csv which contains uh, the actual uh, data which is in a csv format so if we have to apply this to our uh, tutorial that is this particular tutorial okay so in our example we have our bucket name as my dms 2018 so this is our bucket name address is going to be the name of our schema or our database and zip code is going to be the name of our table hence we created these two folders under our bucket so as you see this is our entire structure and um, again depending upon you know however whatever structure you want if you want to create a separate structure you're more than welcome to do that but uh, one folder above your csv so let's see our csv is over here you know you see this shortly so i have my zip.csv here so this folder one folder above it is going to be treated by default as the table name and the folder uh, that is two above our csv is going to be treated as our database so this is something that uh, dms assumes by default there's nothing much that you can do about this okay this is how it treats the data uh, in s3 uh, when it's when it's trying to read it okay so uh, please ensure that you you keep this in mind okay so uh, let me switch back now to my presentation so we have created these two folders that is address and zip code and after we have created these two folders we need to create a json schema for our csv table structure now i have actually gone ahead and created the schema so that uh, we can actually you know just use the schema for our tutorial so let us review through the schema now so as you see we have one single table and the table name is zip code as you saw earlier the table path is address slash zip code remember address is our schema or our database name and zip code is our table name the table owner of course in this case is address and this particular table uh, zip code has the following columns so the first column is zip and it is of type integer it is the primary key and it is definitely uh, not nullable so you definitely need to have a value over here obviously because it's the primary key after zip we have a column um, called as place and this is a string and its column length is 50 Similarly, we have state, and after state, we have state abbreviation. Again, that is string, but the column length is only two. After state abbreviation, we have a column called as county. And again, that is of type string, and the column length is 50. After county, we have uh, latitude and longitude, and both of these columns are numeric in nature. Again, the total length is six, and as you see, the column scale is four. So what this essentially means is that after the decimal point, we have four places, okay? And before the decimal point, we have two. That makes it a total of six. So now let us review through the, the data that corresponds to this particular table structure. So as you see, in total, we have about seven columns. So this is my zip.csv right here. And as you see, we have nine rows in this uh, zip.csv. So the first one, as we just saw earlier, the first column uh, um, right before the comma is our zip code or the zip. The next is our uh, place. After that, we have a state. Then we have the state abbreviation. Then we have the county. After county, we have latitude. And finally, right at the end, we have longitude. And we have uh, nine records over here as a part of the CSV. 
So this is a CSV as we just saw, and we are going to go ahead and upload the CSV to our zip code folder. Now you can find the zip.csv uh, and the zip.json at this particular GitHub location if you would like to practice this tutorial on your own at a later date, okay? So feel free to go ahead to this particular GitHub location and download these two files for practice purposes. Okay, so let me go ahead and now upload the zip.csv right over here into our uh, S3 bucket. So click on upload, uh, add files, and this is zip.csv right there. So select zip.csv, next, next, and then next, upload. So our zip.csv has been uploaded successfully. So after we have uploaded our zip.csv to our uh, S3 bucket under address slash zip code, the next thing that we need to do is to go to AWS database migration services. And then we need to first create a replication instance. Now ensure that you use the instance type as dbt to micro to keep the charges at the lowest. Not all replication instances are free, hence including dbt to micro, hence you can potentially incur charges for, uh, for your replication instance. Okay, so just be careful with that. So let me switch back to the console and let us switch to database migration service right here and click on replication instances and create replication instance so let us give this replication instance a name as uh, dms 2018 rep and i'm going to give the same as uh, the description right here now, as you see, by default, the instance class is DMST to medium, but I'm going to go ahead and change this to DMST to micro. You can leave the engine version as default. I'm going to go ahead and launch this in my default VPC because that's where the rest of my other servers are. And multi AZ is, uh, we don't need multi AZ for this particular tutorial, so I'm just going to leave it no. If you click on advanced, uh, ensure that you change the allocated storage to eight. We don't have to do anything um, great over here. So I'm just going to reduce the storage to eight to keep charges to the minimum. Again, availability zone, if you have a preference, I'm just going to go ahead and select US East 1A. And the security group is going to be the default security group for our VPC. So just to remind you again, a few minutes back, we had actually um, modified our RDSs security group to ensure that our EC2s and our VPCs default security group are able to communicate with our MySQL RDS server on port 3306. And this was the precise reason why we did that because our uh, replication instance will be using VPCs default security group. Now we will keep the rest of the properties as default and then go ahead and create this replication instance. So there it is, it is currently creating a replication instance at this time. And it generally takes a few minutes to, to kind of have this instance provisioned and be available. So I'm gonna go ahead and refresh this a couple of times, but in case it is taking longer, then I will have to pause the video and restart the recording once the instance is available. So as you see, our replication instance is now available and uh, it is up and running. So let us go, move, go back to our uh, presentation right here. So the next thing after we have created a replication instance is to go ahead and create a source endpoint for our S3 bucket and then test it. So switching back to my AWS console, click on endpoints and click on create endpoint. 
and the endpoint type over here is going to be source and we are going to give the endpoint identifier as s3 source right here the source engine is going to be s3 so we're going to select s3 and we are going to specify the role arn that we had just created sometime back remember we had created this role with uh, S3 read only access and RDS full access. So I'm going to go ahead and paste this ARN right here. The bucket name is going to be my DMS 2018. Scroll further down, and this is where we will copy our JSON table structure. So let me switch back over here and copy this entire JSON structure and paste it right here as part of the table structure. So as you see, this is our entire JSON structure. Uh, we don't have any CDC under advanced options. I'm just gonna leave everything empty at this time. And for VPC, we need to select uh, default VPC. For me, at least it is default VPC. But ensure that you select whatever VPC that you have launched your other servers in. Now go ahead and click on run test. Now if everything is successful and it is able to connect to our S3 bucket successfully, then our connection uh, should be uh, successful. Sometimes it does take a while to, for it to kind of test the endpoint connection. So if this takes a little longer, then I will stop recording and resume recording once the testing has been completed. So hopefully this is done uh, soon. So there it is, our connection test is successfully. So let us go ahead and now uh, save this particular endpoint. So after we have created our source endpoint, the next thing that we need to do is we need to go ahead and create our target endpoint for MySQL and then test the endpoint. So let me switch back to our console, click on create endpoint, click on target. Now, as you see, we have an option over here called as select RDS DB instance. So go ahead and check that. And by default, uh, as you see, our MySQL RDS instance is selected. We are going to give this an endpoint identifier as MySQL hyphen target. And the target engine is MySQL in this case. The server name is the DNS name of our uh, MySQL server or the endpoint for our MySQL server. So again, I had copied this. I'm gonna go ahead and copy this from our notepad and paste it right here. Port is 3306 because that's where the communication is happening. We are not going to use SSL, so I'm just going to select this as none. So for this particular demo, my username, password, and my DB instance identifier, everything is MyDMS2018. And again, this is just to keep things simple so that we don't waste time in debugging or anything of that sort. So this is my username, and the same is my password. Scroll further down. Under advanced, uh, I'm just going to keep everything as default. And then for VPC, we need to go ahead and select default VPC. And the instance type is our DMS 2018 rep that we had just created. So then we need to go ahead and test our uh, endpoint. So click on run test. And again, uh, sometimes this connection uh, takes a while. So testing this endpoint um, might take some additional or extra time. Okay, so just be patient if you are doing this uh, by yourself. So hopefully this is done shortly. Okay, so there it is, okay. So our connection test is successfully. So let us go ahead and click on save and save our target endpoint. So after we have created our source and target endpoints, the next thing that we need to do is that we need to create a task to migrate data from S3 to MySQL. And after we create the task, we need to run the task. And after our task is run successfully, we will see that a database name address is created in MySQL and a table name zip code 
is created uh, in MySQL as well. So basically we will have an ad a database called as address and inside address we will have a table called as zip code and this zip code should be populated with all the records that we have in our CSV. So remember our uh, CSV has nine records and all these nine records should be populated in our MySQL zip code table. Okay, so let us switch back to our AWS console. Click on task, create task, and we give this the task name as S3 to MySQL. This is our application instance. Uh, our source endpoint is S3 source, and our target endpoint is MySQL target. Now, for the target tables, I'm just going to leave this by default, like drop target tables. We don't have any tables on our target. This is a brand new database, but you can just leave it as it. We don't have any LOB columns, so I'm going to go ahead and say don't include LOB columns. Again, enable validation or enable logging is not needed. And this is the most critical part, guys. This is the table mapping. Okay, so you can either go ahead and type the JSON out over here, or you can use the guided version. So we'll be using the guided version right now for this particular tutorial. So go ahead and say enter schema. And I'm gonna keep the schema name as a percent and the table name as percent, which is just the wildcard. Because um, our, if you remember our schema name and our table name are present in uh, our JSON file. So that's pretty much it. And this is basically going to go ahead and include um, all the tables. So basically the action should be included over here. So go ahead and click on add selection rule. And then our selection rule has been added. And finally, go ahead and click on create task. So after we create this task, remember, this task will be initiated or started automatically because we have checked that option right here on the top. Okay, so let's go ahead and create task. And our task is currently being created as you see. And this is the overview of the task. As you see, the entire summary is right here. And uh, switch to table statistics. And you will see that if it creates any schema or table in our target MySQL, then you will see those that, that schema and table created right here. And you will also see the number of rows that it has loaded into the table. Okay, so just keep on refreshing this. And eventually you will see the schema as address and the table as zip code. So refresh is starting now. So hopefully there should be something over here shortly. Okay, just keep on refreshing it and you will see uh, the schema and the table being created. So there it is. So our address schema and our zip code table has been created on our MySQL RDS database. And let us see if the rows are loaded. As you see, the rows currently are at zero. But if you refresh, yeah, there it is. So all nine rows have been successfully loaded to our zip code table in MySQL. So let us go ahead and confirm this now. So we will switch to our MySQL client right here. And we will connect to our database. So the command for that is mysql hyphen h and then our database uh, endpoint. So let me go ahead and copy that from here. So this is a database endpoint right here. So copy this, go back, paste it. Okay, and then we will use the port as 3306. Username is my EMS 2018 and the password it is going to prompt us so just ensure that you end it with minus p and hit enter the password in my case is my EMS 2018 and hit enter and there you see we are connected to our MySQL server now let us see if it has created our database or not so the 
So the command to check what databases are available on this particular server is show databases. So as you see, our address database has been created. So let us now switch to this particular database. So type in use address. So as you see, our database has been changed. Now we need to check what tables are available under address. So remember, we should be able to see our uh, zip code table. So there it is, our zip code table is present under our address database. So after our zip code table, let us go ahead and look at its structure. So the command for that is describe uh, zip code right here. And if you see, the field is, uh, we have field zip, which is big int. This is the primary key. And uh, place over here, which is where care, state, state abbreviation, county, latitude, longitude. Again, it has decimal uh, 6, 4, which is what we had provisioned or basically mentioned in our uh, JSON file. So as you see, this entire structure has been created as per our JSON format. Okay, so now let us go ahead and see if our records have been copied to our zip code table. So say select star from zip code. And if you see, uh, all our nine records are right here. So our records have been copied in successfully. Okay, so I guess this kind of completes this uh, tutorial logically over here. Please ensure that you uh, release all the resources, especially your application instance, your RDS instance, and your EC2 instance. Okay, if, if you forget to do that, then you will incur some surprise charges. Okay, guys, so that's it from me today. Thank you very much. And uh, please do let me know your comments. If you would like me to create a video on any specific topic, then do let me know. Otherwise, till then, goodbye, and I will see you shortly in a new video. Bye-bye. Hello all, and welcome to this AWS tutorial. In our tutorial today, we will talk about AWS database migration service and discuss how we can migrate data from Microsoft SQL Server installed on an EC2 instance to a Microsoft SQL Server on an RDS instance. Before we go further ahead with the demo, a couple of things to keep in mind. First is that AWS resources provision in this tutorial may not be free tier eligible and can incur charges. Using DMS service can also incur charges. And last but not the least, and the most important point, is that ensure that you clean up your resources after this tutorial is over. This is to avoid any unwanted charges later. For this tutorial, I have done certain amount of pre-prep. Hence, if you are doing this tutorial by yourself, ensure that you complete all the steps shown on the slide before moving further ahead. For this tutorial, I have already completed these steps. So let us review the steps before we move further ahead. The first thing that we need to do is, we need to launch an Amazon Microsoft Windows Server 2016 instance with SQL Server 2017 standard installed on it. This is the AMI ID right here. Ensure that this particular instance has public IP enabled and you can launch this instance either in your default VPC or your custom VPC. We will use this instance as our source database server. For this particular tutorial, I have used the instance type as M5 large. Now, typically, if you want to uh, provision SQL Server 2017 Standard Edition, it generally requires a large instance or probably even sometimes an extra large instance. But for this particular demo, I have used M5 large. Ensure that uh, when you provision this instance, 
check the cost associated with it okay because this instance is not free tier eligible after you have provisioned this ec2 instance ensure that inbound ports 1433 and 3389 are open in its security group once the instance is up and running rdp into this ec2 instance and download Adventure Works database backup from the below location. So this is the URL from where you need to download this file on your EC2 instance. So just download the file and copy it in a, in a location. You can copy directly into your C colon, wherever. So just have this file downloaded because we will be restoring this file in our steps later. So after we are done with our EC2 instance, the next thing that we need to do is we need to launch Microsoft SQL Server Standard Edition on our RDS instance. Now again, ensure that you launch this instance in your default VPC or your custom VPC. In this case, choose the use case as dev or test. Select the DB Engine version as SQL Server 2017 14.00.3035.2.1. version the DB instance class, choose that as db.r4.extra-large uh, with 4VC CPU. Username, password, I typically just keep it same. It's up to you, whatever you want to use. But in this particular tutorial, I have used the username, password as my RDS 2018. Now again, this RDS instance is not free tier eligible. So you will incur charges if you provision this instance okay and um, while provisioning this instance it will actually also show you the cost associated with it so ensure that you note the cost after your rds instance has been provisioned go ahead and modify the rds security group to provide inbound uh, access to ec2 security group the, the security group that is associated to your ec2 instance and your VPC's default security group so that they can communicate with this uh, RDS instance on port 1433. Okay, so as I mentioned earlier, I have already completed these steps uh, and my setup is completely ready. Okay, so now we will go further ahead with the steps to perform the actual migration from our uh, SQL Server on our EC2 instance to our SQL Server on our RDS instance. So these are the steps. Now, before I go further ahead with this, let me review through my setup and I will showcase my setup to you as well. So let me switch to my um, AWS console right here. So as you see, this is my RDS instance. It's up and running. This is the DB class. And this is the endpoint of my RDS instance. You want to keep make a note of this endpoint. And again, my EC2 security group as well as my VPC's default security group has access uh, to this particular RDS instance and they are able to communicate over port 1433. So let us quickly review that to ensure that we don't face any challenges later in the game. Okay, so once this comes up. Okay, so this is right here, an inbound communication on for port 1433 for both of these security groups is, um, is enabled. Okay. Uh, the next thing that we need to do is just scroll down, look at all the properties. As you see, all the properties are right here. And this is launched in my default VPC. And my availability zone is US East 1A. And rest of all the other properties are by default. Okay, so after we have reviewed our RDS instance, let us go ahead and review our EC2 instance. So my EC2 instance should be here. It is up and running now. And so this is my EC2 instance right here. And as you see, this it is it has a public IP and this is the public DNS. 
and it is currently up and running. This is a security group associated and the security group is uh, opened uh, for port 1433 and 3389 for inbound communication. Okay, and I have actually gone ahead and RDP'd into this instance right here. So this is my instance and I have gone ahead and downloaded the AdventureWorks database backup file and saved it on my local disk over here on C colon. Right here. So you can see the backup file is right here. Okay, so we have our uh, source uh, server up and running. We have our target server also up and running. So we are all set. So now the next thing that we need to do is go ahead and follow the steps on our, on our slide. So these are the steps to migrate from EC2 MS SQL to RDS MS SQL. So the first thing that we need to do is on our MS SQL EC2 instance, we need to launch our SQL Server Management Studio and log in using Windows authentication, okay? So let me switch to my RDS um, RDP over here instance and let me start and launch my SQL Server Management Studio. So it should be somewhere right here. Uh, Let's see if I can find it. SQL Server Tools. SQL Server Management Studio, right there. So go ahead and launch uh, SSMS. And once it is up and running, we will um, continue with rest of the other steps. So let us review the steps in the meantime. So let me switch back to my presentation. The first thing that we need to do after uh, we log in into SQL Server is we need to change the authentication mode from uh, Windows to Mix mode. Okay, and then after that it will automatically restart the service. And uh, once we have changed our authentication mode, we need to ensure that we go ahead and reset the password for SA. Now you can choose the password of your choice I typically just keep SA, SA is just easier for me, but if you want to keep the password as SA, ensure that you uncheck uh, enforce password policy, okay, because otherwise it does not like the SA password is too weak. And if the SA login is disabled, we need to ensure that we enable the SA login. And finally, we need to restart the MS SQL server. Okay, so let us see if our Studio is up and running. Okay, so our SQL Server Management Studio is up and running. So when it comes to server name, you don't have to do anything. You just have to type in a dot over here. When you type in a dot, that essentially means that it is the local server. Okay, so you don't need to give any server name or anything. Just, uh, you know, type in dot as I have done right now. I don't know if you can see the dot or not, but just type in dot and Use Windows authentication and click on connect. And you should be connected to your uh, SQL server on your EC2 instance. So as you see, this is my SQL server on my EC2 instance right now. So the first thing that we need to do is we need to change the authentication. So select the server, go to properties, and then go to security and change the server authentication from Windows authentication to SQL Server and Windows authentication mode and click on OK. And as you see, uh, it tells you that this configuration changes will not take an effect until SQL Server is restarted. Okay, so if you want, you can go ahead and restart the server now or you can uh, restart the server later. Okay. So after we have done this, the next thing that we need to do is uh, we need to go in under security, logins, and then select SA, and then click on properties, and go ahead and reset the password for SA. So I'm going to keep the password as SA right here. And that's just easier for me. But if you want to keep password as SA, 
ensure that you uncheck enforce password policy and click on OK. And as you see, SA is not currently enabled, so we need to enable this login. So go back into the properties and go back to status and say and select uh, login as enabled and click on OK. And click refresh. OK, so our uh, SA login is now enabled. And what we need to do is we need to restart this service. So I'm going to go ahead and restart our SQL Server. So click on yes, yes, and it should uh, stop and start the service shortly. So after our SQL Server comes up, we need to go ahead and restore the AdventureWorks uh, backup, uh, database backup on this particular server. Okay, so let us review the steps. So after we restart the MS SQL, the next thing that we need to do is restore AdventureWorks database backup that we had downloaded earlier. And after we have restored the backup, ensure that SA has DB owner access to this AdventureWorks database. Now, um, you can try to give the DB owner access to SA from the console itself. If that does not work, use these two statements in the query window and provide DB owner access to SA. And after we have done uh, uh, restoring our AdventureWorks database and providing access to SA, we will go ahead and count the number of rows in our AdventureWorks uh, database and in schema, there's a schema inside called as person and that has a table also called as person. So we will go ahead and count the number of rows in this person table. Okay, so let me switch back to my SQL Server and now I'm gonna go to databases, right click, say restore database. And once the pop-up comes up, uh, click on device and then say, click on this ellipsis right here and select our database file. So you'll see the backup media over here should be fine. And click on add. And in this pop-up, go to the location where your database backup, AdventureWorks database backup was downloaded and saved. So I have it in my C colon right here. So I'm gonna go ahead and select it. So this is my AdventureWorks 2017 backup. Click on okay. Okay, and click on OK. And our uh, AdventureWorks database should be restored shortly. So there it is, our uh, database was restored successfully. So click on OK. And then if you go ahead and open up databases, you will see AdventureWorks 2017 right here. And over here, you will see tables, under tables, you will see person and person right there but before we go ahead and do a select count we need to ensure that we have provided SA uh, access to this database so let's click on properties and click on user mapping now you can try and give it from here uh, sometimes it gives an error okay so it's giving me an error so if it gives you this kind of an error that cannot use a special principle uh, SA just click on okay um, cancel this whole thing and open a new query window. So say new query window with the current connection. And then copy these two, uh, those two statements, these two statements right here. So I will try and copy it from my uh, slide over here. Okay, so these are the two statements. I'm just going to copy these two and go back and paste it right here and say that using this AdventureWorks 2017 database, uh, change the permission for SA. So just select these two and hit F5. Okay, I had a special character over there. So there you go. So these two uh, statements have been uh, executed successfully. Okay, 
So now let us go back to our uh, person table right here. And we will try and select top thousand rows first. And as you see, these are it has a lot of rows in this table. Okay. So let us go ahead and select the uh, count. So select count are from adventure works person person schema person table. And if you go ahead, select the line, hit F5, and you will notice that there are 19,972 records in this, uh, in this table. Okay, so let me just quickly go ahead and increase the font size so you'll be able to see my query. So this is the query, guys. Select count star from Adventure Works uh, 2017 person dot person and the number of rows that are there in this table is 19,972. Okay, so we have uh, completed all the steps on this particular slide. So I'm going to move ahead now. So after we have, uh, you know, restored our uh, Adventure Works database on our source server, it is time to go ahead and uh, prep our target server. Now our target server is also a SQL server and it's an RDS instance, but we can use the same SQL server management studio that is there on our EC2 instance to connect to our RDS uh, SQL server instance as well. So we will go ahead and do that. And for this particular instance, remember we had given the username password as my RDS 2018. So we will be uh, using SQL authentication to log in. So let us go ahead and do that first. So let me switch back to my um, uh, EC2 instance console over here. And as you see, this is my SQL server on my EC2 instance. So we will go ahead and create a new connection. So click on connect database engine and we will give the engine name instead of dot this time we will give the engine name of our RDS instance. So I've copied my RDS instance endpoint right here. So this is my RDS instance endpoint and I'm going to go ahead and copy that right here. And instead of Windows authentication, go ahead and select SQL Server Authentication. And my username password is my RDS 2018. My RDS 2018. I hope I got the password right. Let me type it again. It's 2018. There you go. And then go ahead and click on Connect. And you are now connected to your SQL Server RDS instance. Okay. So go ahead and open the databases as you see it's empty. So what we will do is we will go ahead and create a, a demo database over here. Okay. So let me quickly switch back uh, to the slide presentation. So the next step for us is to create an empty database named DMS demo DB on our RDS MySQL. Okay. And again, we need to ensure that my RDS 2018 has DB owner access to this DMS uh, demo DB that we will create. Okay, so let me switch back and let us uh, create an empty database called as DMS demo DB. So right click over here, select new database and give the name over here as DMS demo DB and owner is default and click on OK. And this should create an empty database over here for us. I think I made an error in the name. So I'm going to DMS demo DB. OK. Yes, I wish to continue. OK, I don't have permissions to do that. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to create another database, guys. So if you happen to make such mistakes like me, then ensure that you have the right database name over here. So it should be DMS demo DB and click on OK. And then 
uh, right click over here go to properties and let us just review through the properties so these are the properties right here file groups options tracking as you see everything is all set okay so now the next thing that we need to do is uh, let's go ahead and ensure that our my rds 2018 user has a db owner access to our dms demo db so let us go ahead and select our my rds 2018 user right click click on properties and if you go to user mappings over here here it is so if you see uh, dms demo db is right here and it has if you select this it has the db owner access so we are good so i'm just going to go ahead and cancel this so we have completed uh, these steps until here so our target is now up and running and is available for performing any kind of uh, data migration activities so the next thing that we will do is now we will go ahead and uh, you know, provide all the endpoints and the replication in, uh, instance and create a task in our AWS database migration service. So the first thing that we need to do is we need to um, create a replication instance. And again, the replication instance for this is going to be dbt2 medium. And uh, this is again, not free tier eligible. So you can potentially incur charges, okay? So let us go ahead and switch to our AWS console. And I'm going to go to uh, database migration service right here. And click on replication instances and create a replication instance. Uh, you could give whatever name you like. So I'm just going to give EC2 SQL to uh, RDS uh, SQL rep and I'm going to give the same as a description I'm going to leave the D uh, the instance class as DMST to medium engine version also you can leave as default ensure that you provision this in the same VPC so um, my uh, EC2 instance and RDS instance are in my default VPC so I'm going to go ahead and select Paul VPC. Uh, my multi AZ is just going to, I'm just going to keep it no at this time. Uh, you can review through the advanced properties. I'm just going to leave everything default over here, except I will go ahead and change the VPC security group over here as default. Rest all properties I'm going to leave as default again. Maintenance also I'm going to leave as default. And I'm going to go ahead and click on create replication instance. And our replication instance should be provisioned shortly. Now, sometimes depending upon the load, it takes uh, a while to provision this instance. So I'm going to wait for a few minutes to see if this instance has been provisioned. If not, then I will pause the recording and resume recording once uh, the instance is up and running. So let us refresh this a couple of times to check if it's up and running or not. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and pause the recording and I'll restart recording once this instance is available. So as you see, our instance is now up and running and it is available right here. So we will continue ahead with the rest of the steps. So let me switch back to my presentation. So our application instance has been provisioned. So the next thing that we need to do is we need to create a source endpoint for our EC2 MySQL. And we will use the SA credentials to test the source endpoint. So let me switch back over here, click on endpoints. Create new endpoint. Select the endpoint type as source over here. And we will give the endpoint identifier as MS SQL 
uh, EC2, EC2 source. And we we'll select the source engine as SQL Server. And the server name is going to be uh, the, the uh, DNS endpoint of our EC2 instance. Okay, so if you go back over here, um, go back to instances, EC2, and copy the EC2 public DNS. Okay, so running instances. Okay, so this is a public DNS right here. So go ahead and copy that. And uh, sorry, I came to the wrong window. And go ahead and post paste that in your database migration service server name right here. The port is going to be 1433. SQL server mode, uh, uh, sorry, SSL mode is going to be none because we're not doing any uh, SSL uh, encryption at this time. Username is going to be SA. My password is SA. And the database name is going to be um, AdventureWorks. So type in AdventureWorks 2017. Okay. And you can review through the advanced properties, but nothing. I'm not going to change anything in the advanced properties. VPC is going to be default VPC. Our application instance is the one that we just provisioned. And click on Run Test. Now, sometimes testing this endpoint connection can take a while. So uh, if this takes a longer time, again, I will have to pause the recording and resume once the testing is complete. So it's still taking some time, but I'm gonna wait for a couple of more seconds. Hopefully this should complete soon and it should test uh, successfully. So I believe it says saying login field for user SA. So I need to go ahead and check my SQL server. So it's right here. Um, I believe we had changed the authentication type to, sorry, to SQL server Windows authentication. Okay, let me restart the service once again just to ensure that uh, it came into effect. Sometimes if you don't, if the server does not restart correctly, you may get this error as well. Okay, so our service has been restarted. So I'm going to try and test this thing again. So our connection tested successfully. So let us go ahead and uh, create this endpoint. So let us click on save. And that should create our uh, source endpoint. So let me switch back to my presentation. So after we have created the source endpoint, the next thing that we need to do is we need to create a target endpoint to our RDS MS SQL. And we will use our my RDS 2018 credentials to log in. And we will then test this particular target endpoint. 
So let me switch back over here to my AWS console, click on create endpoint. And this time the endpoint type is going to be target. So we are going to select an RDS DB instance. And as you see, some of the values are pre-populated over here. So it is my RDS 2018 SQL Server. The endpoint identifier would be um, MS SQL RDS target. And the target engine is going to be SQL Server. The server name, I have it right here. This is my um, uh, SQL Server RDS endpoint. So I'm gonna go ahead and paste that right here. Port is gonna be 1433. Uh, SSL mode is going to be none. Username is going to be my RDS 2018. Same as the password. And the database name is going to be DMS. Uh, I think what was the name? It was a DMS demo DB. Okay, so DMS demo DB. Okay, um, I'm going to leave the advanced attrib attributes as default. And further down, select the VPC as default VPC. And then click on run test. Now again, testing this endpoint uh, might take a while. So I've given a hyphen on the top and it does not like that. So I'm gonna remove spaces. Let me see if it's the hyphen on the space. Again, click on run test and it was the spaces. So again, testing this endpoint might take a while. And um, again, if it takes a longer time, I will have to pause the video and resume recording again. So hopefully this endpoint uh, connection tests successfully. So let us wait for a few moments. It's taking a while. Let's see. Okay, so I connection tested successfully. So let us go ahead and now click on save. So now our both source and target endpoints have been created. So the next thing that we need to do is we need to create a task to migrate data from our SQL server on our EC2 instance to our RDS, uh, SQL server on our RDS instance. And what we will do as a part of this task is we will select the schema as person and the table also as person and essentially basically migrate uh, the data from our person table, uh, which is present on our uh, EC2 SQL server to our RDS uh, SQL server. So remember we had about uh, 19,972 records in this particular table. Okay, so let us go ahead and create a task. So click on task now and then click on create task. So we are going to give the task name over here as uh, EC2 SQL to RDS SQL and replication instance is the one that we just provisioned. Our source endpoint is going to be our MySQL uh, sorry, a SQL server on EC2 and our target endpoint is going to be a SQL server on RDS. For migration type, we are going to say migrate existing data. We will start this task once it is created. On the target uh, table preparation, we will say drop tables on target and we don't have any as such LOB. So you can either say don't include LOB columns or you can or let's say limited LOB mode to about 32 KB. If you want, you can go ahead and enable logging that will help you to debug. But remember that K will come with some additional charges. For this demo, I'm not going to enable logging. So now this is the most critical part, which is the table mappings. So over here, let us go ahead and select the schema name. Okay, so we are going to select the schema as person. And for table, we are going to give the table name also as 
person and we are going to say the action is include and click on add selection rule so as you see this is going to basically migrate data from a schema person and in schema person we have a table also named as person from our ec2 sql server to our rds sql server so we are not going to add any transformation rules at this time so let us go ahead and click on create task. So after this task is created, this start will start immediately. So our task is currently being created and you can see the details of the task right here at the bottom. So basically it's going to migrate uh, the data. As you see, the migration type is full load. It's currently creating. What you would want to do is you would want to go ahead and click on table statistics. And now uh, once the task is uh, enabled or started, you will see that the data in this particular table over here at the bottom will be populated. So you should see the schema name as person and the table name also as person. And it will actually also showcase you the number of rows that it has loaded. So just keep on refreshing this. It is not the most efficient when it comes to refresh. So as you see, our task has started now. So refresh it and you should be able to see some information on in this table shortly. Okay, so as you see, uh, the schema name is person, table name is person. The table load has been completed and it has gone ahead and loaded 19,972 records. And this was the number that we were expecting as well. So uh, let us switch back to our, uh, our SQL Server Management Studio and let us connect to our RDS instance. As you see, it's connected right here. So I'm gonna go ahead and open this click on databases and you will see under DMS uh, demo DB, we should have a table over here called as uh, person person. So this is a table and it has been created under the schema name also as person. So let us go ahead and now select the top thousand rows in this table that just got copied over and as you see it has a lot of rows in this so i'm going to go ahead and remove all the columns and we will go ahead and select count for this table so select count um, star and now as you see we have our entire query right here so we will select count star from dms demo db person dot person and this should be equal to nineteen thousand. 972. <coughs> so as you see, uh, all our records have been copied over successfully from our uh, SQL Server on our EC2 instance to our SQL Server on our RDS. So this is it, guys. Um, I hope this was helpful. Um, this is a pretty common scenario. You will actually face this scenario in your day-to-day -day life when your client is trying to move their uh, data from probably their SQL Server on-premise or let's say if they have done an, a lift and shift migration to AWS and now they want to use SQL RDS. So you can use this to migrate data either from your on-premise SQL Server or even from your SQL Server on your EC2 instance. Basically, migrating from uh, SQL Server on-premise EC2 to SQL Server in RDS. So thank you very much and uh, please provide your feedback. If you have uh, you know, any thoughts of any videos that I should create, then do uh, have them posted in the comments. Um, I will try to you know, have those videos created as soon as possible. So thank you so much and uh, have a nice day. Bye-bye.
Hello all and welcome to this AWS tutorial on DynamoDB. In today's tutorial, we will see how to create a DynamoDB table, how to insert items in a DynamoDB table, how to scan and query a DynamoDB table. Let us see what is DynamoDB. So DynamoDB is a fully managed NoSQL database service that provides fast and predictable performance with seamless scalability. DynamoDB allows you to create a database table that can store and retrieve any amount of data and serve any level of request traffic. Its flexible data model and reliable performance makes it a great fit for mobile-based application, web-based applications, gaming applications, edtech applications, IoT applications. You could potentially use DynamoDB for any other application as well. For our tutorial today, we will be creating a DynamoDB table using its default read-write capacity units. The default read-write capacity units for DynamoDB is five. So we have five uh, read capacity units and five write capacity units. Let us understand what is a read capacity unit. A read capacity unit represents one strongly consistent read per second or two eventually consistent reads per second for an item up to 4 KB in size. Item sizes for reads are rounded up to the next 4 KB multiple. For example, if I am reading a file which is of size 2.5 KB, it will consume the entire throughput of 4 KB even though it is lesser than 4 KB. And the reason behind it being is that one read capacity unit is of size 4 KB. And any other unit, let's say if you add more units to uh, this as well, each unit is of size 4 KB. That means the first unit is of 4 KB, the second unit is of 4 KB. Hence, if I have two read capacity units, I would have a total size of 8 KB. You cannot reduce this size. Okay, so even though your item size is lesser, it will still consume the entire throughput of 4 KB. Let us now understand what is a write capacity unit. A write capacity unit represents one write per second for an item up to 1 KB in size. Item sizes for writes are rounded up to the next 1 KB multiple. So for example, if I am writing an item which is of size 500 bytes, it will consume the same throughput that an item of size 1 KB would consume, even though it is half the size of 1 KB. Again, just like the read capacity unit, the write capacity unit is provisioned in multiples of 1 KB. So let's say if I had um, an item which was of size 2 KB, then it would provision two write capacity units. But let's say if I had another item which was of size 2.5 KB, then it would provision three write capacity units of size 3 KB. Remember, it's in multiples of uh, 1 KB. Although my uh, item size is 2.5, it will still consume the entire throughput of 3 KB. Now, I will be creating a separate video on how to calculate read and write capacity units for your DynamoDB table depending upon your item size and the number of items that you um, read or write per second, okay? At this point of time for this particular demo, we will just go ahead with the default read-write capacity units. After we have created the table, then we will add records or items to our uh, table. Finally, after we've added items, we will scan our table and then query our table. So let me quickly switch to my AWS console. So this is my AWS console right here. And I'm going to switch to DynamoDB. Okay. And let us click on uh, create table. And I'm going to create a table over here called as orders. So the table name is orders. And I'm going to give it a primary key called as order ID. And I'm going to make it a numeric key. Now, as I mentioned earlier, we will be using the default settings of DynamoDB. So as you see, it has 
a minimum of five uh, read capacity and five write capacity units. So let us go ahead and click on create. And as you see, our table is currently being created. So once our table is created, then we will go ahead and add items to our table. So as you see, our table is now created. This is our table name orders right over here. This is our primary partition key order ID, which is numeric. We have disabled a point in time recovery, encryption, time to live. Our table status is active. Um, the provisioned uh, read capacity units is five. Same as the write capacity units, again, five. And currently there are no items and the storage size currently obviously is zero because there are no items. Okay, so let us go ahead and now add items to our table. So click on items and then click on uh, create item over here. So as you see, our primary key is order ID. So I'm going to give it an order ID over here as one. And then I'm going to add a couple of more columns. So let's say I'll add um, another column over here, uh, which is of type string and I'm going to call it as order uh, order let's say order name okay let's say i'm going to say this is nams uh, order okay then we will add one more column to this let's say of type uh, i'll say list okay so we'll say order items and we will add something over here of type, I'll say string. So I'm going to say, I'll give it something like soap. Okay, add one more item, string, and I'm going to say, uh, maybe, okay, I'll just say, um, uh, maybe paper, something like that, maybe. Okay, I'm just gonna say toilet paper. Okay, and so we've added a couple of items over here. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and now click on save. So as you see, our first item record was created over here. So let's go ahead and create one more item. So I'm gonna create an item with item order, uh, item ID as 34. And again, we will go ahead and append a string. So this time I'm gonna give it uh, order date and yes and when it comes to DynamoDB you can have different kinds of columns okay so we are going to give it the uh, date as 11th November 2018 okay and let's say I'm going to give this uh, a, a, a value over here so is it uh, order status okay so let's give it order status and the boolean value is True. Okay, so, so I'm going to go ahead and save this. So as you see, our columns for our first order and our second order are, are different. Okay, so let's create one more item. We are going to give this order number as 700. And I'm going to add, uh, say, order name again. I'm going to say general order and then i'm going to say again um let's say boolean over here order status and i'm going to give value as false i'm going to go ahead and save this order so we've created three orders over here as you see uh, with order id 1 3 34 and 700 and these have different types of columns. So this is the beauty of DynamoDB, right? It's a no SQL uh, table. So you could potentially have different kinds of columns over here and you could have uh, different values in them as you see. So this is great. Okay, so let us now go ahead and scan our table. So in order to scan our table, remember this, the scan table actually scans the entire table. If you want, you can add filters. So let's say, I'm going to go ahead and give, uh, say, order name, and it says it is 
string and let's say contains order and now we are going to click on start search so it will basically give us all the orders which have um, order in its name so let us click on start search okay so there is nothing that matched okay let us say equals nam so let's see if this research sense okay nothing still um, names order is looking for a specific match okay still nothing okay there you go so that was my mistake over there it should have been I had the wrong column name so I'm going to go ahead and remove this and then go back to my original query so order name so yeah it is case sense it is uh, basically if you have space or anything in between it is sensitive to that okay so now let us go and click on start search so we got our two orders as expected over here so names order and general order okay so a couple of things to keep in mind guys uh, whatever order or the column name that you give over here ensure that you have the same name on the top if you give a space over here it is not going to match it okay so this was a scan so we can pretty much give any kind of filter if you want to if you don't want then it is basically just going to go ahead and scan the entire table so if you just click on start search as you see it scanned the entire table and return us all the three records now let us go ahead and query the table so if we click on query over here so as you see if we query a table you you have to provide uh, a value for primary key and that is because how the query table works the query table basically goes and searches for records that match the primary key it looks for that particular record compared to scan which actually scans the entire table so it basically picks up all the records in the table and then applies the filter expression on it versus query will only pick up records that will match your primary key value so let's say if i'm going to give a value over here as 33 and uh, start search so we don't have any records for 33 let's say if i give 34 and click on start search then it will re return me the record where the primary key value is 34 now if i want i can certainly add additional filters over here so let's say uh, attribute i'm going to say order status is equal to false okay so click on start search again we don't have any records wherein uh, the order id is 34 and our order status is, is false so if i change this to true then our record should show up so order status is true okay so now it should show up okay why is it not showing up boolean okay so again i had the wrong type over there so click on start search and there you see our order status showed up so this is our record right there so keep this in mind guys uh you would need to ensure that the column name is the same as the column name over here no don't have any spaces or anything of that sort the column type also should should match so if you select this as string or number it's not going to work and again the value should match accordingly so this was uh, our uh, you know a little example over here to scan our table and to query our table now i have created a slide wherein we will see we'll basically compare and contrast and understand what is the difference between a scanning a table and querying a table and versus what are the similarities as well so let me switch back to my powerpoint presentation right here so this is a, a small table over here as I was talking. So scan operation, as we saw as well, reads every item in a table or a secondary index, if you have a secondary index. Versus a query operation finds items based on a primary key value. Hence, it, if you remember, if, if I switch back over here for query, we have to provide a primary key value. If you don't provide, it's not going to go further ahead. So let me remove this and let's 
if I go down and click on start search, you saw it gave me an error over here saying that this value is empty. I have to enter a value. So if you have to perform a query, then you have to provide a primary key value. It's mandatory. But let's say if I change this to, to scan, then this will disappear. And as we discussed, this will just scan the entire table. So again, by default, a scan operation returns all the data attributes of every item in a table or index. So if I just go ahead and click over here on start search, it is going to return me everything. As you see, all attributes of all items are returned. Okay, now you can query any table on a secondary index or a composite primary key, it really doesn't matter. But when you're performing a query, it will basically only pick up records where the primary key value matches. And if you've provided filter expressions, then it will filter out that and it will provide you only what matches uh, after filtering everything. Okay. Now you can use projection expression parameter so that the scan only returns some of the attributes rather than all of the attributes. So that is a possibility, but by default, it is just going to go ahead and return you all the attributes of all the items. Due to this above reason, scan operation or performing a scan operation on any table in general is slow and it's especially slow for large tables. Okay, so this is very, very important. Keep this in mind, uh, especially if you, let's say if you go for an interview, they can ask you, what is the difference between scanning a DynamoDB table versus performing a query on a DynamoDB table? And should you even perform, uh, you know, scan operations on DynamoDB? I mean, you can perform if you really need to, but otherwise it is typically not recommended to perform scan operations on DynamoDB table. As we saw, it actually performs a scan on the entire table first, and then it applies the filter expression to filter out what you have requested for. Vis-a-vis -vis a query will act only pick up items that will match your primary key value. Okay, so by default, the read consistency for both scanning a table and querying a table is eventual. If you want, you can set the consistent read parameter uh, to basically true, and that will change the read consistency to uh, strongly consistent. And that is true for both when, when you perform a scan table and a query table. The default result set size is one MB for both scanning a table and querying a table. Again, as far as the filter expression is concerned, the filter expression is applied after a scan finishes. That means when, you, when it scans the entire table, after that, the filter expression is applied. But before the results are returned to you. So it scans the table, then applies the filter expression, and it, then it res returns the result uh, to the caller. Okay, so therefore a scan will consume the same amount of read capacity regardless of whether a filter expression is present or not. A filter expression for query is applied after a query finishes. So let's say you had filter expressions in your query. Remember, the of a query only picks up items based on the primary key value. So once it has picked up those items that, have, that matches the primary key, after that, it applies the a filter expression on those items. And then after applying the filter expression, then the results are returned to the user or the caller. Therefore, a query will consume the same amount of read capacity regardless of whether the filter expression is present or not. That is because it first uh, gets your items which match your primary key value and then it applies the, uh, the filter expression on that so hopefully guys this was helpful uh, i tried to cover some basics for dynamo db in this particular tutorial and uh, some of these things are extremely important so I ensure that you you know feel free to pause the video read through this table in detail especially if you're preparing for an interview it will help you 
to answer some of the questions uh, thoroughly well. Okay, so that's it from me guys for today. Um, hope you like this video. Please feel free to provide your comments and uh, if you want me to create videos on any specific topic, uh, have it posted in the comments and I will try my best to have those videos created for you. Thank you and have a nice day. Bye-bye. Hello all and welcome to this AWS tutorial on DynamoDB. In today's tutorial, we will learn how to calculate read and write capacity units for our DynamoDB table. Let us understand what we mean by read capacity unit. A read capacity unit represents one strongly consistent read per second or two eventually consistent reads per second for an item up to 4 kb in size. So what this statement essentially means is that there are two read consistency types as far as DynamoDB is concerned. First is a strongly consistent read consistency and the other one is eventually consistent read consistency. So if we have provisioned one read capacity unit, we can perform one strongly consistent read per second. And with the same amount of uh, read capacity units, we can perform two eventually consistent reads per second for an item up to 4 KB in size. Item sizes for reads are rounded up to the next 4 KB multiple. So what this means is that if you're performing an, a, a read, then the item size needs to be rounded up to the next 4 KB multiple. That essentially means that one read capacity unit is of 4 KB. Hence an item size, let's say if you have an item size of uh, 2.5 KB right over here, then you need to round it up to the next 4 KB multiple. So in this case, the next 4 KB multiple would be 4 KB. Hence, if we are reading an item which has size of 2.5 KB, it will consume the same throughput as much as an item which actually is of size 4 KB. To, cal to calculate the number of read capacity units, take the item size and round it up to the next 4 KB boundary. So when we say the next 4 KB boundary is nothing else but multiples of 4. So it will be 4, 8, 12, 16, etc. So depending upon this item size, you need to get it to the nearest 4 KB multiple or the 4 KB boundary. So if the item size is 2.5, then it will be 4. If the item size is 6 KB, then the nearest uh, 4 KB multiple would be 8. If you have specified a strongly consistent read, divide the roundup size by 4. This is the number of read capacity units required for strongly consistent read. For an eventually consistent read, which is the default option, take the strongly consistent read capacity units and divide it by two. In case you have a decimal number, then you round it up to the nearest integer. So let us take a couple of examples and, and understand how read capacity units are calculated. So as you see, um, I have mentioned the read consistency type over, right over here. And keep in mind that one consistent read capacity unit is equal to 4 KB, a read for 4 KB. Okay, so in our first example, we will uh, understand how to calculate read capacity units for strongly consistent reads. So let us consider that our item size is 10 KB. In that case, and we are performing uh, one uh, read per second. Okay, the number of items that we are reading per second is just one. In that case, the roundup item size for 10 KB would be 12 KB. Okay, because that is the nearest 4 KB multiple. Remember we discussed it is the multiples of four. 
So the nearest 4 kV multiple would be 12 kV. Now we need to take up this round up size, item size, and divide it by 4. So after we divide 12 by 4, we get 3. Hence the number of read capacity units that is required to read an item size of 10 kB for a consistent, strongly consistent read would be 3. Let us take another example over here. Let's consider that the item size is 7 kB. And again, we are only reading one item per second over here. Then the roundup size for that would be 8 kB right here. If we divide 8 by 4, we get 2. Hence, we would need 2 read capacity units to read an item size of 7 kb. Let us take another example. Let us consider that our item size is 14 kb. In that case, the roundup item size would be 16 kb. That is the nearest 4 kb multiple. Again, if we divide 16 by 4, we get 4. Hence, we would need 4 capacity units to read an item of size 14 kb. Now, after we have calculated the read capacity units for strongly consistent type, let's say if we change the type to eventually consistent and keeping the item sizes and the number of items to be read per second the same, what would be our read capacity units? So let us understand that. So considering that our item size is 10 KB for an eventually consistent read, again, the number of items read per second is one. What we need to do is we need to consider the, uh, the number of read capacity units for strongly consistent read. So as we calculated it over here, right at the top, it was three. So I've copied this number over here in this particular cell. Now what we will do is, we will take this read capacity units and then divide it by two. So essentially the eventual, uh, eventual consistency would be half of the strongly, uh, of the strong consistency, okay? So you take three and divide it by two, which will give you 1.5. Hence, uh, the number of read capacity units required for an eventually consistent read would be two. Let us take the next example over here of item size 7 kb. Again, we had calculated the strongly consistent read capacity units for this as two. To, to calculate the eventually consistent read capacity units, we will divide it by two, that is take the half of it, and that would give us the, the read capacity units for eventually consistent read, which would be one right here. Let us take another example, 14 KB. Again, the read capacity units for strongly consistent read is four, dividing it by two and considering the half over here. So we would require two read capacity units for an eventual, cons eventually consistent read. So until now, we had kept the number of items to be read per second as one, and I had just kept it one uh, to keep things simple. Let's say that if we increase the number of items to be read per second, let's say if I increase it from one to five over here, as you see, for a strongly consistent uh, read. So let's say if I am now reading uh, five items, per second of, of size 10 KB, then what would be uh, the number of uh, reads capacity units I would need? So let us calculate that. Remember over here on the top, we discussed that for one, the number of read capacity units for one item is three. So I've copied that right here in this column. So if we have five items, it is pretty simple, it's a no brainer, right? It is three into five, which would be 15 read capacity units. Similarly for seven KB items, if we are trying to read five items of size seven KB, 
the number of read capacity units for one item was two. So two into five would give us 10. Similarly for 14 KB, again, if we are reading five items, so it will be four into five, which would give us 20 read capacity units would be required to perform five uh, uh, item reads per second of size 14 KB. Now let us similarly calculate the same for an eventually consistent read. So let's say now we have the same item sizes, the same number of uh, reads per second, which is five. We had calculated the read capacity units for five items over here in uh, earlier. Right? This is our number of read capacity units for uh, five items. Uh, per second. So I've copied that over here as you see. Okay, now remember that eventual consistency reads uh, are basically half of the strongly consistent read. So again, we have five items of size 10 KB. Uh, the number of read capacity units for a strongly consistent read were calculated as 15. So for, for an eventually consistent read, we would have to divide that number by two. So as you see, I have uh, divided over here 15 by two, which is equal to 7.5. Now, if you remember, I had mentioned in the slide that if you get a decimal number, in this case, which you have, rounded up to the nearest integer. Hence, you will see over here that to perform um, a read of five items of size 10 KB, we would need eight read capacity units for eventually consistent read consistency. Let us look at another example over here. Let's say the item size is seven KB. Again, we are reading five items. We had calculated the strongly consistent read capacity units as 10. Again, we divided by two, which is uh, five, and then we would have the read capacity units as five right here. And similarly for 14, our read capacity units were 20, we divided it by two to get uh, 10 uh, eventually consistent read capacity units. Okay, so let us go back to our presentation and now let us understand what is a write capacity unit. So a write capacity unit represents one write per second for an item up to one KB in size. So unlike the read capacity, the write capacity basically gets rounded up into one KB multiples, okay? So item sizes for writes are rounded up to the next one KB multiple. So for example, if I have an item which is of size 500 bytes, it will consume the same throughput as an item which is actually of size 1 KB. So even though it is half of uh, 1 KB, it will still consume the entire 1 KB throughput because one write capacity unit has the size of 1 KB. To calculate the number of write capacity units, Calculate the item size in KB. So let's say if your item size is 3 KB, then that is the number of read capacity, uh, write capacity units required. So for an item size which is of 3 KB, the number of write capacity units would be 3. So let us take a couple of examples and look at this as well. So I've put in a couple of examples over here. So remember that one write capacity unit is equal to 1 KB. So let us consider an item of size 3 KB. So our item size is 3 KB and the number of items to be written per second is 1. So in this case, the roundup item size would be 3 KB. Okay, this is the nearest 1 KB roundup, which is 3 KB. It's pretty straightforward, right? So the right capacity units that you would need would be 3. Now let us consider that you had an item size of 500 bytes. In that case, uh, uh, the roundup item size would be 1 KB. As we remember, 
each write capacity unit is 1 kb. Hence, the number of write capacity units needed would be 1. Let us consider if the item size is 2.5 kb. And we are writing one item per second. In that case, the roundup item size would be 3 kb. And the number of write capacity units that you would need would be 3. Now let us increase the number of items to be written per second. So let's say we keep the item sizes the same, but we increase the number of items to be written per second to 5. In that case, the roundup size item, item size would be, remember it was 3 over here, so 3 into 5, which is equal to 15 KB. And hence the number of write capacity units that we will need would be 15. Similarly, if, for, uh, if we have a 500 byte item size item and we, have, we are writing five items per second, in that case, remember the roundup item size was 1 KB. So 1 into 5 is equal to 5 KB. Hence, the number of write capacity units that would be needed would be 5. Let's consider if our item size is 2.5 KB. Remember the roundup size over here was 3 KB. So we take the same roundup size over here multiplied by 5, which will give us a total item size of 15 KB. And hence, the number of write capacity units that would be needed would be 15. These are a couple of reference URLs in case uh, you would like to read up more on read and write capacity units. Uh, these, uh, all of these URLs do discuss these concepts in far more detail, so feel free to read through or at least glance through them, but ensure that you understand this thoroughly, especially if you are working on your AWS certification, professional, uh, even associate, it doesn't hurt to understand how read and write capacity units for DynamoDB are calculated. So that's it from me guys for today. Uh, do let me know uh, your feedback. Please post your comments and if you would like me to create a video on any specific topic, then have it posted in the comments and I can certainly have that video created at the earliest. So thank you so much and uh, have a nice day. Bye-bye.